Polyphase filters are a class of specialized filters used in sample rate conversion. Whereas most FIR filters have one delay line, polyphase filters have multiple. To understand the logic behind this, we we'll first have to dive into the topic of sample rate conversion. But before we continue, I would like to mention that I'll be posting on the VHDL Wiz website. If you're not familiar with it, this is a website where you can find plenty of useful information about VHDL, such as tutorials, tips and tricks, courses and even libraries. You can find the link in the description. So, sampling rate conversion is the process of modifying the available bandwidth of a signal. It comes in two flavors, decimation and interpolation, where decimation reduces the bandwidth of the input signal and interpolation expands it. This technique has numerous applications, but the main reason to use it is to reduce the computational load of the signal chain. Let's say we have a speech processing system with an ADC and a DAC running at 48 kHz. This results in an input and output with bandwidth of 24 kHz. Let's assume the human voice ranges between 0 and 6 kHz, hence it has the bandwidth of 6 kHz. This means that the conversion bandwidth is 4 times wider than the effective bandwidth of the signal. This difference allows us to reduce the input signal bandwidth by 4 times without losing any useful information. This in return leads to a reduction of the memory and computational requirements of the system. For example, if we have to record 1 second of the input signal at the original sampling rate, we have to record 48,000 samples, whereas with the sampling rate conversion, we have to store only 12,000 samples. Another benefit is the available computational power. If the device can perform a thousand multiply accumulate operations per sample at sampling rate of 48 kHz, at sampling rate of 12 kHz, it would be able to perform 4000 multiply accumulate operations per sample, which is a significant computational gain. In the real world, sampling rate conversion is frequently used in telecommunication, radars and audio signal processing. For example, the oversampling library in JUICE uses the polyphase filter to interpolate the signal. Another common use for decimation is in Sigma Delta ADCs, where the modulated input has to be filtered. After removing the high frequency components of the input, the signal can be downsampled. This can be implemented with a decimating polyphase filter. As mentioned before, sampling rate conversion comes in two flavors, interpolation and decimation, where interpolation aims to extend the bandwidth of the signal. This is achieved by inserting samples between the existing ones and decreasing the sampling period. To be precise, it's realized by inserting zeros between the existing samples. This operation is also called upsampling. This, however, causes a little problem. Upsampling the signal has the unpleasant side effect of introducing frequency components that did not exist before. The new components are actually copies of the original signal, also known as spectral images. These spectral images are centered around multiples of the original sampling frequency. To remove the unwanted signals, a low-pass filter is applied after the upsampling of the signal. Ideally, the filter should remove all spectral images above the original Nyquist frequency. Therefore, interpolation is a two-stage process of upsampling followed by low-pass filtering. Feeding an FIR filter a signal that contains a lot of zeros results in a lot of multiplications by zero. This implies that a big portion of the processing power used by the filter is wasted. As you can imagine, this property can be used to reduce the computational load by skipping all calculations involving zeros. Let's take a look at an example. We have an upsampled signal by a factor of 4. This means that between each sample we have inserted 3 zeros. Now, let's apply the signal into a 12-tap FIR filter. As you can see, 9 out of the 12 samples present in the delay line are zeros. Therefore, to obtain the output, we need only three multiply accumulate operations. As the time advances, the samples change their location with respect to the coefficients. However, the overall amount of non-zero values in the delay line remains the same. So what we can do is split the filter into L amount of segments, where L is the interpolation factor, and compute only the segment that has non-zero input samples. After rearranging, the filter is split into four subfilters, each containing the coefficients of the respective segment. In other words, we have divided the filter into four phases, hence the name of the filter. Because each phase is active only once for every L output samples, it is possible to implement the subfilter as an FIR filter that operates at the original sampling rate of the signal. 
the output of each phase is connected to a multiplexer synchronous to the output sampling rate. At this case, it runs four times the initial sampling rate. This process is equivalent to the upsampling stage in the direct interpolation previously discussed. As previously mentioned, the summation is the process of reducing the available bandwidth. It is also composed of two stages. Low pass filtering followed by downsampling. When samples are removed from the signal, the available bandwidth gets reduced. In return, the spectral components that lie beyond the new Nyquist frequency enter the downsampled spectrum, resulting in aliasing. To avoid this, low pass filtering is performed to remove all high frequency components that lie outside the new frequency band. Ideally, the filter should remove all undesired frequency components, but in reality, this is not feasible. Hence, the attenuation of the filter determines the error caused by the process. After the filter, the signal is downsampled by preserving only one sample for every m samples, where m is the decimation factor. As you can imagine, skipping most of the output filter samples periodically implies that some of the filter computation can be skipped. In the normal FRAR filter, to calculate a single output sample, it is required to multiply every tap in the delay line by every coefficient and sum all the products. This can be referred to as sample by sample convolution. Following this logic, we can perform the convolution only whenever we need to produce an output value. And hence, having the filter active only once for every m input samples. This results into the input samples shifting by m taps between each filtering operation. Using this property, it's possible to group the input into frames of m values where each value from the frame is fed into a dedicated subfilter. Therefore, the filter is split into four phases, each receiving one value from the input frame. In this particular design, the frame is distributed to the subfilters as the input values arrive. However, in a real implementation, the subfilters receive the input values once the whole frame is received. This allows the subfilters to operate at the output sampling rate. Therefore, the polyphase decimator improves the computational load by performing the filtering operation at the slower sampling rate. When it comes to FPGAs, the polyphase filters do not look that efficient compared to the direct implementation. If implemented as the diagrams show, both filters would use the same amount of multipliers. If, however, the fast sampling rate can be handled in series, some improvements can be done to the filter architecture that would reduce the multiplier use. In case of the polyphase interpolation filter, all subfilters receive the same input data. Hence, instead of multiplexing the output of the phases, it would be possible to merge the delay lines of the subfilters and multiplex the coefficients instead. The new filter structure, however, has a flaw that may cause timing issues. The same problem was resolved in episode 1, where the direct FIR filter was transposed by placing the delay elements after the multipliers. The same approach can be applied here. Now, the delay line lies into the fast sampling domain. Therefore, instead of delaying the data by one sample, each delay element must delay the data by L samples, where L is the interpolation factor. One important thing to mention is the order of the coefficients. Since the structure was derived by reversing the signal path, we also have to reverse the filter coefficients order. Similar approach can be applied to the polyphase decimator. The filter phases can be optimized via pipelining, just like the multiplex polyphase interpolator. The pipelining solves the problem partially. Luckily, it's possible to further optimize the structure by pipelining the phases of the filter. Just like the interpolation polyphase filter, it's possible to multiplex the filter coefficients. As a result, the delay lines are merged into a single interleaved delay line. The products from the different phases form a frame and to obtain the final result, the values from the frame need to be summed. In this case, this is implemented via an accumulator at the output, which produces one output sample per frame. The final filter structure is almost identical to the transposed polyphase interpolator. The only major difference is the summing operation of the output. Therefore, for this implementation, I would like to combine both filters into a single configurable device. The implementation is fairly simple. It starts with a phase counter that is going to multiplex the filter coefficients. There are two instances of the counter, one counting up and one counting down, where the former is used for the interpolation and the latter is used for the decimation. Next, there are two nested loops, one for the filter phases and one for the taps. 
within the nested loop is the filter structure. The first statement applies the input value to the multipliers. The actual implementations has registers before the multipliers, but this will not affect the performance of the filter except for adding one sample propagation delay. This is added to shorten the path between the inputs and the output of the multipliers. Next, the phase counter is used to multiplex the coefficients. This is followed by an if statement that describes the multiply add operations. Notice there is no sum operation at the very last stage. The last statement in the loop shifts the data along the pipeline. After the loop, there is the accumulator required for the decimation architecture. Finally, the filter result is assigned to the output port. This one is also architecture dependent. The interpolation process introduces a gain loss equal to the interpolation factor. Therefore, when using the interpolation architecture of the filter, the last statement aims to correct for the gain loss via bit shifting, which would be accurate only for certain interpolation values. This statement, however, can be skipped if the filter coefficients are multiplied by the interpolation factor. To test the filter implementation, I have created the following system where the input and the output are sampled at 96 kHz. The decimation filter will reduce the sampling frequency to 12 kHz and then the signal will be interpolated back to 96 kHz. This corresponds to a conversion factor of 8. The filter coefficients were generated in MATLAB. Ideally, the filter should remove all frequency components above 6 kHz and pass all frequency components below 6 kHz without affecting them. This, however, is not possible due to the finite amount of filter coefficients. Therefore, during the design of the filter, I had to factor in the transition band. As a result, I had to decrease the cutoff frequency to 4 kHz. Now, all components above 6 kHz lie into the stop band of my filter. Before I test the design, I would like to demonstrate the signal path without the sampling rate conversion. As you can see, there is no attenuation in the pass band. Notice there is some harmonic distortion probably caused by the DAC. Next, I would like to demonstrate what happens if the signal is downsampled without being filtered. Once downsampled, the signal is directly fed to the DAC and hence oversampled by 96 kHz. At the bottom is the spectrum of the input signal and at the top is the spectrum of the output signal. Notice the harmonics at the output. When the input signal is less than 6 kHz, the output signal is composed of the original frequency combined with the spectral images created by the oversampling. When the input is above 6 kHz, the frequency components reflect back into the new passband, resulting in aliasing. The spectral images are still present. In the next test, I have added the decimation polyphase filter. Notice in this test, once the input signal exceeds 6 kHz, there are no spectral images. This is because the decimation filter removes all frequency components above 6 kHz. For the final test, I added the interpolation filter. As you can see, there are no spectral images when the input signal is below 6 kHz. I also tested the design with the filters that provide only 27 dB of attenuation. As you can see, there are still spectral images and aliasing present in the output. Therefore, it's important to consider the filter performance when designing a sample rate conversion system. The polyphase filter structure implemented in this video was based on the assumption that the data in the fast domain can be handled in series. In some applications, where the fast sampling rate is too high, it's possible to handle the data in parallel. This is where the initially described polyphase filter would come into play. The filter can be adopted by removing the multiplexers since the data would already be organized in frames. The frame rate would equal the slow sampling rate. One thing to keep in mind when using the polyphase filter is the amount of filter coefficients. It should be integer multiple of the sampling conversion factor. In this design, I used the filter coefficient set with 120 taps. And since the conversion factor is 8, the filter is going to use only 15 multipliers. As mentioned before, when designing the decimation filter, it's a good idea to leave some headroom above the spectrum of interest. In particular, the designer should factor in the transition band of the filter. If the cutoff is too high, then the upper part of the new spectrum would be attenuated. This, however, can be corrected with a high shelf filter. If, on the other hand, the filter cutoff is too high, the filter will pass spectral components that would alias into the decimated spectrum. 
similar considerations apply when designing an interpolation process. As briefly mentioned, the interpolation process introduces a gain loss equal to the conversion factor. This can be corrected by multiplying the amplitude or the coefficient set by the sampling rate conversion factor. A user guide from Xilinx also suggests versions of the polyphase filters which are tailored to the Xilinx architecture. The main difference between the Xilinx versions and mine is the delay line placement. Mine is between the DSP slices, whereas theirs is at the input. In fact, their implementation might be able to achieve better timing performance. The issue with the Xilinx version, however, is the way the coefficients are indexed. It has to take into account the pipelining delay between the multipliers. As a result, it would be more difficult to call the mechanism that has to index the coefficients, which would reflect on the resource use. The user guide also describes various applications of the DSP slice. The polyphase filters can be used only when the sampling rate conversion factor is an integer. Whenever a fractional sampling rate conversion factor is desired, then polyphase filters with different conversion factors can be cascaded. I skipped a lot of information when it comes to sampling rate conversion and the theory behind it. But if you're interested, you can check out chapter 10 from Understanding Digital Signal Processing. It explains the rules, limitations and trade-offs in sampling rate conversion, as well as some filtering techniques alternative to the polyphase filters. Finally, if you'd like to see how I test my FIR filter designs, you can check the post I made recently on the VHDL WIS site. The link is in the description. Also, you can find the source files in my Git. Anyway, I hope you found this video insightful and I'll catch you next time. Cheers!